we took a close look at what we thought we could achieve and I had a really good person who's had the experience of drafting law for other governments before. So without that expertise, I don't know that we can have done something so ambitious without that real lawmaking experience. The plan was about uh, having a, our own management strategy because we realized that you know the, the government um, uh, superimposing its, its, its law, regulation, policy in the community just did not work. The community constitution, uh, I, can, I can say honestly that no band members obviously don't know it by heart, they don't know it word for word, but they do know the, um, the gist of it. They know that they have now have rights, they know that they now have a say, they know that there's process in place, they know that the government has to be accountable to them as members. We um, ratified our constitution and we're going to abide by our own laws and we're going to protect the territory according to how our ancestors set us out to do that. Everybody owns it, not us, it's owned by the community. And uh, our parliament, our government, is actually our people that tell us how we are going along and tell us what directions to go. Overall, uh, the NISCA Constitution is a, is a critical document to our ongoing governance. It's in many ways makes very explicit our fundamental beliefs about how we should come together as a nation and how we should govern ourselves uh, and the way that we're going to do that. When we look at the Constitution, uh, the draft that we actually operate on right now, we have two constitutions. We have the Society Act Constitution, which is what it is, and there's a section in there that says, and they may meet and do business as they see fit carry out the businesses they see. That's where this other document comes into play. This other document talks about the sector councils, it talks about the elections at the communities, it talks about and embeds in the, the things that we know are you know, important, the vision, etc, etc, etc. So it's more really talks about how we're structured and where we're trying to get to, but we call it an internal document. So that's the work in progress. Um, it's going to change a little bit more and it's going to change a little bit more and we're not going to go out for big citizen a stamp of approval until it's to the point where we know that it's almost ready. So how it's been working is from smaller exercises, smaller exercises. So if you ask somebody in the community, did you work on the community constitution or the nation constitution, they probably go, no, I think we might have done something a long time ago because they would have been talking about values, you know. They would have been talking about smaller sections or having smaller dialogue around smaller sections that feed into this bigger document. We also do have some work that's taking shape within the communities around community constitutions though because we understand that we will have two levels of constitution. Paramountcy held in the nation constitution, um, but to really uh, the sections that deal with how people are elected or, or selected in government, etc., that belongs within each community construct. So we create room within the nation for those people to be brought into that uh, entity. But it, we really have to allow some, I won't use the term sovereignty, but some flexibility and some, the uniqueness of community to actually be, be uh, considered and, and, and sanctioned. Policy approach to lawmaking, actually we had precedent with it in how we developed our constitution. And we had hired a public policy grad student to help us uh, lead a community uh, constitution building process and uh, it was very cost-effective uh, way of getting to a lot of analytical issues and obviously uh, um, often contentious issues in our community when we're dealing with issues of membership and um, other controver controversial things that get set out in a constitution um, but we found that was a very cost-effective way to get very, very bright people uh, helping us with some major community building exercises. And I think I, I would say that upon reflection, the biggest um, part of the constitution exercise was the development of it was the community building part instead of the product at the end. It was really developing the constitution that um, was uh, important uh, part of uh, community building. So we had that precedent of uh, looking at it from a public policy perspective through 
the development of our constitution over several years, and uh, it worked well and it made the ability to um, draft so many laws possible for us because it was a far more affordable way to use uh, legal experts more sparingly and uh, to draw upon other expertise um, in making important community and uh, political decisions. We tried to be as collaborative as possible uh, to ensure that we had that right mix, to ensure that um, we had the laws general enough to provide flexibility, but uh, specific enough to provide sound foundation of, uh, that provides for fairness and stability and those sorts of things. So I think what's most important to note is although we had lots of expertise, uh, it was twas and people making public policy decisions. They were making those judgment calls about how we want to run our governance, how we want to run our community, um, and what those basic rules of fairness should be. Uh, and I know there are people concerned that with the number of advisors we have that uh, we uh, were getting lost in that mix, but uh, to be clear, we really, really sort of led the decision-making process and all those aspects of public policy to best fit our community. The Constitution, what is your Constitution? It's your ultimate law. And when I look at the NISC Constitution, that's exactly what it is. It provides some of the key elements of what we need in order to govern ourselves. It has certain foundational provisions such as who is the Niska Nation. It defines who the nation is. It contains provisions that say what are our fundamental values and beliefs. Um, about, it defines what our official language is, Niska and English. It defines um, some of our structure of governance. It defines the role of our elders in our, in our governance. It also contains fundamental provisions such as Niska lands and how sacred those Niska lands are to, to us and to all future generations. And how before anything happens in terms of um, developments on Niska lands or any kind of uh, process whereby um, you know, Niska lands will be made available in large quantities, before that can happen, it has to be approved by the... Um, by, uh, by the legislature and in certain cases by the Niska Nation. So um, basically it's uh, an important document that in many ways protects who we are because it protects our identity, it protects our lands, it protects our culture, and um, it protects also certain political rights and freedoms that Niska citizens need to have. Um, you know, the right of free speech, of free thought, to hold opinions, the right to ask questions, um, the right to vote for who our uh, elected members are. Um, the Niska Constitution is the guarantee that, that says, yes, we're going to implement this treaty, but we're going to implement this treaty in a way that ensures that ultimate accountability comes back to Niska citizens. It's Niska citizens who ultimately have a say over the important direction and, and future direction of the, of the, of the Niska Nation and, and Niska government. And so the Niska Treaty, I think, provides many of those protections uh, right in the document. You know, some other, um, I think, uh, key provisions are um, is uh, identification and defining who our Niska citizens are. And basically, that's one, I think, of the defining characteristics of Niska Nation. When we went into the treaty process and we went into the development of the Constitution, one of the, the biggest crimes against humanity, in our view, was, uh, but in particular, the Niska Nation, was was the whole patrilineal system in the Indian Act. The idea that, that um, um, a Niska mother, for example, um, couldn't marry somebody who wasn't status, but a, 
but a Niska male could marry somebody who was uh, not status. And in the case of uh, the mother, she would lose her status. In the case of the, of the man, he would keep his status. So what we did was uh, in the treaty identify who is entitled to be enrolled and that protection is extended to all Niska citizens in the Constitution. So in many ways, it's, it's, uh, we used our, our Constitution also became a way of announcing to the world and to our own people, we're going to correct this wrong. And that if anybody basically lost their status that way, they're still Niska in accordance with our treaty and in accordance with our Constitution. And if they enroll as a citizen, they have all the political rights and freedoms of, of all Niska citizens. The Constitution is, is uh, definitely unique for our community. It, uh, it addresses uh, our vision for the community. It addresses those things that we wanted. We wanted accountability first and foremost to our, our members, not to the government necessarily, but to the members. We wanted to know what was going on in this office. We wanted to know, you know where our resources were going, um, where our money was being spent. Uh, all those things were really important to us. Um, we didn't want to see the uh, the old. Um, w there was a lot at one time of issues going on where you know certain people were getting benefit and the rest were being left behind. We didn't want that. We wanted equality. We wanted a say in what was happening. So the Constitution addresses a lot of that. The you know, first step was for you know for us to inform the community you know what our objective was and then to uh, begin the process of, of uh, sharing that information as it continually came up. And uh, then, you know, then the, uh, uh, the element of, you know, government came into the picture. So then, you know, then the formalization of, of the documents began to happen over a period of time. And uh, so, you know, we had to continually inform the community and, you know, because there's, you know, in the beginning, as always in community, there's a risk of, of a conflict, there's a risk of, you know, change is not always that welcome, as we all know, in community. So, you know, you've got to handle it very carefully. Uh, you know, you've got to have the people understand what it is that, you know, we're trying to achieve. And then from there, then, you know, you can have um, uh, a, a good grounded, on the ground conversation with the community and more specifically in the language I think that really uh, is one of the key factors is, you know, when you're educating and informing and sharing information, that it be at, at two levels. One that is relative in the community, number, number two, if it's not number one, one or the other, and that is to engage the community in your, uh, in, you know, in, in the language. Say what you do, do what you say, and prove it. And so it's just three simple steps. Um, you have to put on paper uh, what your practices are. Uh, you have to demonstrate uh, those practices. And lastly, you have to prove that you've done those practices. So it's a, it's a very uh, simple process uh, along those lines. We're told we can only move as fast as the people. So I anticipate that uh, because we're still working on the community constitutions and there has to be a jive between them, we can't sanction this one and then go back here and go, oh heck, we didn't see that, that nuance that has to be uh, coordinated. Um, that work in the community constitutions uh, we're seeing as a concentrated effort next year. There's going to be a little reorganization that takes place within the next couple months within the Nation Council again um, to dedicate more energy to that work. Um, we see that work as being really important, especially now as uh, other challenges are coming to us. Um, we've just uh, made a in the Atmok Declaration, which is a declaration of the nation to protect a particular part of our territory. That's grizzly bears habitat, uh, a sacred site for us. Um, some of those things are going to require us to actually be better recognized as a self-governing entity, and that is we're going to really going to require that constitution. And I'm almost getting to the point where I'm a little concerned about not sanctioning certain parts of it in, in the broader um, body politic of the people in that um, we're losing a lot of elders very quickly and we have very few what I would call real elders left in that the ones who were fluent speakers from birth and were raised in a traditional way and still understand all of those very important things that we've articulated in the values, they lift them. 
we haven't really lived them. So we're, you know, we can see them on paper, but what do they really mean? We need to have them reminding us of what those things mean. So I think we need, still need some of those voices to say and to actually in the final, you know, in the readout to interpret and to be there to, to say that's why those things are key. Because, you know, it's, it's great having young people coming up and I was just acknowledging how many babies were born again last year. But those people are, 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 are fresh minds that need to be shaped. And depending on what's around them, that's what's going to shape them. And so if we have a good, you know, strong constitution and our structures within government are actually built on that strong foundation, then that's how those people will, will, will grow. If we have shaky walls and, and weak floors, you know, that's how they're going to grow. So I think it's really important that we, we do put that picture in and have it, you know, really, really sanctioned and understood by the, the broader citizenry, um, but not before we're ready. When uh, we started developing a constitution, we uh, hired a public policy student from Simon Fraser University. She researched a couple dozen First Nation constitutions in Canada and the U.S., uh, as well as other constitutions, sort of uh, created a list of headings we could consider of including or not including in our constitution, and then created discussion papers around each heading. So to us in membership would be an example of an exciting discussion. Are we inclusive or exclusive? Is blood quantum an issue? Those were some sensitive issues we had to work through. Um, what are the limits on our government and our constitution? What are our principles around land, culture, and language? So uh, all, all these sort of um, issues got worked out. What should our structure of governance be? Did we like the chief and council system? In Tawasson's case, we decided to expand decision-making by having a legislature to pass laws in our budget and have an executive council, similar to the chief and council system, manage the day-to-day -day laws. But we've also provided um, for, for other governance structures like a judicial council uh, to deal with adjudicatory issues, um, sort of arm's length for governance uh, to be able to challenge decisions uh, our government makes. So that sort of things were what worked through in the Constitution and members of our community met every two weeks off and on uh, with some lapses uh, for two and a half, three years working through these issues. And um, I think what came up with wouldn't have been my perfect view of a Constitution or anybody's. It really was a collaborative process where everybody had to make uh, compromises and uh, it was uh, quite an experience and uh, it was really um, grounded in community participation. To Austin was starting from the very beginning with respect to its, uh, its government and what it was going to do. And so as, as you start to look at what you're going to do, as I say, you start looking at these broad areas of responsibility, uh, jurisdiction as in the case of to Washington and other governments, but the broad areas of jurisdiction responsibility, what the problems are with it, whether it be health or ch ch child care or uh, social assistance or broad, you know, it, it, these broad areas of jurisdiction responsibility, uh, what the problems are within those areas that, that uh, require government attention, what the expectations of the, the community is, and, uh, and what action might be taken. Uh, in order to provide the basis for taking action in each of those areas, one of the first steps is ask, is for a government to ask is do we have the legislation that will empower us to carry out the kind of plans that we're looking at. So legislation is the very basis of policy. It's the, it's the kind of broad expression of intention or of, of what, uh, what might be done and also the broad, uh, uh, the broad outline of where you're going to go. The very basic uh, kind of plan that there is in place, it starts to bring some focus and direction, and it provides for authorization for the government to act. Uh, so that's, uh, that's necessary, but an important part of policy. You want to be able to uh, have the authority to act, as we call it. Um, and uh, the other thing about the, uh, the legislation is sometimes, as part of your plan, you're, you're going to need to have some 
controls over activities. You're going to have to regulate certain things. You might have to set out certain expectations about, uh, about uh, uh, taking responsibility for children to attend schools. Or you might have to take some responsibility uh, for, uh, fa uh, for uh, landowners to do certain things with respect to uh, environmental protection of their lands. And you, you will need, uh, you'll need the power of laws to be able to enforce aspects of that policy. So your legislation sets out the broad responsibility and authority, the broad direction, and also gives the powers to enforce certain actions, to require members or owners of land or, or participants in your economy to do certain things. Uh, and, and all of that is the broad framing of the policy with respect to that particular area. But you know, there's many, many other uh, choices and decisions to be made uh, as you move forward that aren't actually set out explicitly in the legislation, but they still fall within the general direction of the legislation. And so legislation is just one part of the policy uh, enactments of the government, but they all are an expression of policy. Every time you pass a law, it's setting out uh, a direction and certain kinds of means to get to that direction. I consider it our Bible, and uh, all of our lawmaking um, is addressed in the Constitution, so it gives us the power to develop laws as we need to develop them. Um, it doesn't mean that we develop a law every day, but as, uh, you know, as, as things um, progress and we see that there is a need for a law, then the Constitution is sort of our foundation that says, okay, you can develop a law in that. Everybody in this community knows the process. It's you know, it, they know that if, if they don't like something, they can they actually can come to the office and say, you know what, that that law there says you can't do that, so you better relook at it. And you know things like that. It, people know their rights. They know where they stand in this community now. So I, I think it, um, we've come a long way. What we found is that um, our community members have different. Uh, interest levels and how they're communicated to on issues. Uh, most of our members don't like general band meetings. Uh, they find them very uh, confrontational and controversial and not the best way for them to find out information or feel comfortable asking questions. So in our community we have quite a few smaller what we call family meetings where we sit down with uh, certain groupings of extended families based on their um, sort of comfort level of who they want to be with. And we talk about important issues or projects or treaty updates or whatever the issue may be. This constitution ultimately belongs to NISCA citizens. They're the ones who ultimately decide whether or not it's going to get changed or not. It's not the executive, it's not the legislature. They have a role to play in that process of figuring out whether the, the item um, is something that should go forward, but once it gets to that point, it's up to NISCA citizens. So in many respects, it incorporates uh, some of the highest values of, uh, of, uh, of democracy. I can tell you that the Canadian Constitution um, doesn't, in, doesn't allow NISCA uh, Canadian citizens to vote for whether or not it's going to be changed. The constitutional amendment formula is different and is one based on the, the votes of provinces. So you can see once again, we, ha we probably set ourselves up, we set ourselves to higher standards when it comes to, to NISCA democracy. We get um, mired in the problems of the Indian Act and sometimes it's hard to see beyond the Indian Act and the current council and whose brother got what job and these sort of things and sort of step back and think how can we fix this what would be a better governance structure that suits the needs of our community over a long t period of time? And how can we overcome some of these issues, right? And I think the Constitution is a really good starting point uh, for that and for having an expanded vision of your community and what it can be in relation to its governance powers and those sorts of things as well and to set out limitations on what you want your government to be able to do. Um, all these are important things that 
our members need to have discussions so we can have better faith in our governance structures and institutions. So I, I think it's extremely important work. It's time consuming though, and it's uh, really hard, I found, to get off the ground and uh, to continue to make sure there's continuous support for it because it's so time consuming and uh, some of the more day-to-day -day brush fires can overtake um, priorities in the community. Uh, it, so it's, it's, you really have to be committed to a project like this uh, to make it work and to make it the best opportunity for your community to sort of set its, uh, its vision for its future in action. Once we had a, a really good sense of where the community wanted to go, you know, inside the inside the process, which uh, you know resulted in an agreement, and uh, so the agreement then became uh, a tool and an instrument. You know, it wasn't the end all be all. You know, because all all of the you know the framework around uh, the agreement, you know, was was. Um, uh, discussed and agreed to, developed and agreed to by the community. And that was really the important piece of, of any agreement. You know, that was the centerpiece as opposed to, you know, the agreement being, you know, the, the document that we all had to, you know, uh, concede to. Be open to criticism from council members, that what, what you write and what you develop. Be open to criticism from the communities. Be open to criticism from the chief. But always try to be positive and come back with responses that say, oh, I hear what was said, and now let me look at that and see what I can say. So uh, it's, it's very important to be open. Think about uh, how policy decision-making works, if it works well, and do a little bit of preparing and organizing the, your, your First Nation so that the Chief and Council get good support uh, as in the form of policy analysis and good what we call policy briefs, decision-making documents. Uh, and, and engage your, your staff and members of the community from committees and, and members of the community have skills to help do this. Uh, and, but uh, respect the decision makers, re respect your chief and council as the decision makers. And that respect means doing this work. Uh, it won't always be possible to do it perfectly and you know, you've got your shortage of time, so recognize you've got you know, to do it within the time you have. Uh, but develop those skills so that uh, you're organized to actually have a process of, of policy decision making. To amend the constitution you have to have a referendum, a full-blown referendum and uh, so no it's definitely not impossible. Um, one thing with referendums we do get a quite a good turnout for referendums. People are all aware of uh, their, their right to vote and their right to say yes or no. It is an evolving document. Uh, we were all aware of that when we went into it. Um, it was amended in the summer of 2007, uh, not hugely amended, but you know, there's some things that need tweaking and there's some things that just need, uh, as you progress, you realize, oh, that's not going to quite work. So, you know, we have to change that a bit. So yeah, we've already amended it once and I'm sure we're going to amend it many more times as the years uh, go by. You can't not uh, have change without, uh, without working at it. And our biggest enemy I think uh, that we have is is communications, uh, but if we if we, I guess we have to nurture that one every day. I'm like a child, and, uh, and we lose track so easy of things that we need to be doing and who should be doing it. And uh, but our communications will always be our enemy. And if we can keep that one to a low buzz, I think we'll be okay. We we're fortunate; the community seemed to be giving us quite a bit of latitude to do this work. Of course, they're opponents to the treaty and to anything leading to the effective date of the treaty. Um, but overall, I mean, we did a transitional vote in February, just a few weeks before effective date, where the community had to vote on three critical laws and amend our constitution, which required a supermajority of our community participating. They all passed, so that was. Uh, a, a, a good indication of community support of what we're trying to achieve. At the end of the day, it's been a shift now. So, so now we are more focused on satisfying our clientele or our customers, which is our community members. And that's been dramatic because in, uh, we still have to do all the paperwork, 
but whose opinion we rely on most now, of course, is the community. So the shift has gone from government to community. In our community, we're trying out uh, other sort of uh, reporting cycles that include a service plan, an annual report on that service plan. And they're all, and our budgeting process is all linked back to the strategic plan. And, you know, the vision statement is to have a community with a, th a healthy, thriving culture um, that uh, people want to raise their family in, something to that effect, uh, and a number of uh, strategies uh, to reach that. But it, it, that piece is really guiding every other sort of work underway right now. When I, I talk about serving the community and benchmarking where we're at, I want to know what they feel about their institution and if, that, if we can measure their satisfaction with it over time, their governance, that sort of thing. Um, that's something that is very much of interest to me. And So we're partnering with um, UBC Sociology Department with a, a fellow who's experienced in sort of uh, benchmarking more intangible types of things, such as faith in institutions, uh, not just, you know, how much money are people making. So, uh, and success is, is not just about that, it's is our culture thriving again and, and those sorts of things. We have um, lots of hopes and aspirations and for any community I don't think you ever get it right. You can always aspire to be better. Uh, INAC has become a distant memory. Uh, when we need to make decisions, when we need to make plans, uh, we, we talk to ourselves, we meet with ourselves, we talk to our council, we talk to our management team, we talk to our directors and managers. No one ever thinks of calling Amherst or Ottawa. Use the people you have, invest in the people that you have, and really, you know, our plans are not, are not one in two years, they're a hundred year plans. So planning that far into the future is really, really important.